Mildred Kingsley Okonkwo and I'm a pastor. At about the time I entered into university, I was about 16 years old. Um, so I started my period and it just didn't stop. So for about three months, my periods were on. Um, at about that same time, Asu went on strike. So I went home and my parents found out. So they took me to the hospital and I was diagnosed with PCOS. And one of the things I noticed was that the doctor said to me, uh, in fact, he looked very sad, you know, kept shaking his head as he was looking at the ultrasound. And he said to me, um, one of the problems with PCOS is that you may never be able to have a child. And over the years, I went to different doctors, one doctor after the other. And one thing they kept saying to me was that one of the problems with PCOS is that you may never be able to have a child. Um, now, the challenge with that is that everyone knows that in Nigeria, as a woman, one of the things you are known for, or one of the things that people expect of you, is that you must be able to give a man children. I mean, what makes you a woman? If you don't have a child, then you're seen as being a man, literally. You know, so once you get married, people start counting this for you. So I met my husband and I told him, you know, one of the first things I said to him when he proposed to me was, the doctor said I'm going to be able to give you a child. Are you okay with that? And he was very, you know, what does that mean? I know I'm going to have my children and all that. Somewhere in the back of my mind, I was like, okay, well, I'll go with your faith. But, you know, I know what the doctors have said to me. I know what I've experienced. So there was a lot of bleeding. There was a lot of pain. And all the symptoms that come with PCOS, of course. So um, three years into the marriage, I still didn't have a child. And I was getting a bit anxious. And it's a bit harder if you're in the public eye, if you're dealing with infertility. Because imagine being married to a man who teaches faith. God can do anything. And year after year, people are seeing that God can do anything except to give your wife a child, seriously. So I had moments where people would say things to me like, ah, this honeymoon is not over. By now, you should have a child, you know. And people can, can say hurtful things. So I had moments where I was almost going into depression because I would come out and, you know, smile and carry other people's babies, but I kept asking God when, you know. So um, at some point, you know, I had to deal with the fact that you're going to just have to have a happy home. If you get into depression, you're going to frustrate the man who's trying to be supportive. And one of the things I must thank God for is having the kind of husband that I have, because he kept saying to me, I didn't marry you for children, so if you never give me a child, it will be okay, even though I know that you will give me a child. So I walked through that season, doctor to doctor. At some point, I just said, you know what, I'm going to stop, and I'm going to actually practice what I preach, which is the word. So I started staying on the word. I started confessing the word that, oh, the word of God says that I cannot be barren. It's impossible. It just hits me that it's impossible. So it's only a matter of time. So at that season, five years into our marriage, I just entered into faith. For some reason, I just something just clicked. That I knew that it was only a matter of time. I don't care what the doctors had said that I was going to just stand for God being true above every man. And so I kept saying the words, it's the same way you take drugs. I would take my confessions morning, afternoon, night. I kept speaking the word over my body. I kept saying, you can't be disobedient to, the, to God's word. God says, be fruitful and multiply, so you must. And eight years into marriage, I had my first biological child. <sighs> I think the hardest part, honestly, of waiting, apart from, of course, the, um, the things that your body goes through, okay? so always feeling like doctors are using you as a guinea pig they're testing for this testing for that you know tests can really be painful um apart from that i think the hardest part was the hurtful things that people kept saying people said a lot of nasty things actually at some point even got hate mail yeah i got a couple of them uh, that the reason why i wasn't having children is that i was the mother of satan and i was maltreating my husband secretly <laughs> You know, people said things like, my husband has used my womb to make his church grow. So people do say hurtful things when you're going through. Insensitive things, actually, not just hurtful things. Because the hurtful ones, you can chalk it up to people just being mean. But the insensitive ones, like, ah, are you not pregnant again? I thought your tummy was growing big. No, PCOS makes you fat. So it's fat, not pregnancy. And I mean, personally, I don't think that African women you know, have that mindset where we are on a perpetual honeymoon. The Af typical African woman gets married and she wants to have a child. So if she's not having a child, something is up. So it's either she's doing it for her work or there's infertility going on there. But literally, I think we should just learn to mind their business. Mind your business. <laughs> I know that sounds harsh coming from a pastor, but I think people should just learn to mind their business and pray more for people rather than um, 
put them under, the woman is already under pressure. Once it's nine months, and you know, people start making comments like, from the wedding, people start making comments, oh, we'll come back nine months time. So it's almost like there's a time clock that people already put up, you know, set up for you, like a stopwatch that tells you January, February, March. You're already panicking once it's one year, two years, three years. By the time it's five years, you're paranoid. You're going from doctor to doctor. Some women go fetish, they go diabolical. They try to do everything possible to have a child. In-laws give you stress. Thankfully, well, my husband is very, you know, strong and all that. So my in-laws never said anything to me, honestly. Funny enough, was my mom who was a bit, she was anxious because I mean, she's, a, she's an African woman and everyone expects that you should have a child. So I think we should learn to be more sensitive. If someone hasn't had a child in three years, you really should let the couple sort it out. It's really none of your business. If you are worried, then pray privately. I don't think you should even bring it up with them, except they bring it up with you. That's one of the things that I think is a campaign I'm actually into now. Um, so I run a ministry called Hannah's Heart. It's for women trusting God for the fruit of the womb or dealing with infertility, basically, in less Christianese. Um, and one of the things that I'm trying to campaign for is, it's not just when you push a child out of you that you're a mother. You become a mother long before that. A child lives in your heart, not necessarily in your womb. So I think people should be open to the options. There are lots of them. They should be open to surrogacy. They should be open to adoption. You know, one of the things that my pastor, Reverend Femi Eduwali, said to me years ago, he said, the same way you're praying for children is the same way children are praying for parents. So if you make a child's dream come true, then just maybe God will make yours come true. So I believe that adoption is, is, is an option that a lot of us should take. You know, adoption, surrogacy, just because you didn't push that child out, doesn't make you love that child less. Hmm. Trust God, first of all. You know, the funny thing is, um, even if you're going to do IVF or any other procedure, because they're quite a lot, you know, it still takes the same level of faith. I always tell people that even adoption takes the same level of faith. Um, when we first started our journey on trying to adopt a child, I remember back then, um, the, there were many options, but there were times when you would get to the final stage and then they would just say, oh, the mother is not interested anymore. And you have invested your heart, your emotions, your prayer. And sometimes you get to the last stage and say, oh, we've run all these tests and we just feel that, no, this child has complications you cannot handle. You're not equipped to handle it with your lifestyle and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, so it takes the same level of faith. You can do IVF a million times. If God doesn't get involved, you will have wasted your money and your time, and that can be even more frustrating. There's a stigma, literally, over people who they feel um, have not had a child, so they make you feel like you're not woman enough. Now, that's not the only stigma, because once you now get pregnant, and you probably even have a C-section, there's another stigma attached to that. So one of the things I've learned is that you need to learn to live your life not based on what people think or what they say. What's more important is what do you think about yourself, because you're not pregnant, they say you're not woman enough. When you do get pregnant and you have a C-section, they say you're not woman enough. Or when you get pregnant through IVF, or they say it wasn't natural, IVF babies are different, it wasn't God. You need to hear a lot of the things that go, out, go on out there. So the important thing is, what do you think about yourself? Don't let that define you. Having a baby doesn't make you a woman. Not having a baby doesn't make you any less of a woman. Having a baby through C-section doesn't make you any less of a woman than the woman who had a vaginal delivery. So it's important that you understand who you are as a woman. And I don't think any of these things make you a woman. For me, being a woman is a high calling. I think it is, um, it's a ministry. It is, it's a divine assignment. I think that women are built stronger than they think. A woman is created to operate at 1,000 times higher than a man could ever operate. The problem is that we don't know it. So we, we settle for less than we are. To enjoy more of this, our Ugonke videos when you just watch, press this button to subscribe on top of our YouTube page. You go love her.